Dear listeners, thank you for your patience. Apologies for not being on air the last few days. There's a virus going around, a nasty one, that also takes away your voice for a couple of days. So that's what happened. Uh, now we're back and we'll try to catch up on all the streams we missed uh, in the next few days. As well as uh, we hope to add more interesting casts that uh, we think deserve your attention. Thank you again. And here is Aristovich and Fagin, day 112. Dear friends, glad to meet you all on Fagin Live, Wednesday, June the 15th, 10 p.m. Kiev time. I apologize for a bit of delay. We had 160,000 watching us live. We had a previous cast with Maria Maksakova, who sent her regards to Alexei, of course, Alexei. And day 112 with Alexei Ristovich, glad to see you here. Likewise, glad to see you all. Again, my request to the viewers who are watching us, please make sure that uh, other viewers, other people get a chance to see this stream. So post links, share, leave comments and likes. That definitely helps to promote it. Subscribe to Figin Live to Alexey Rostovich. If you're watching that in English, subscribe to the privateer station. All right, Alexey, what is new for that day 112? No major changes on the front, but there are several interesting peculiarities that uh, we can go over. They are still pushing a bit from the north in Kharkov region. Izum, uh, more attempts to the same story. Trying to get to Barvinkova. Russian troops are trying also to promote from Svetogorsk to Bogorodichne, not really working. Liman group attempts to take two places or, or find crossing through Siversky Donetsk. Still unsuccessful. Lysychansk and Severodonetsk, same story, artillery uh, fights. They are trying to get to the south trying to cut us off a little. Our troops are holding the south of Severodonetsk and not letting them progress there. And a lot of activity from Papasne with the same task to cut the road bakhmut lisychansk Did anything change in the last day about cutting that road? Because they announced that uh, they're almost ready and very soon will cut it. We understand they're putting these statements. Yeah, they're putting them out for about 60 days, still unsuccessfully. Whatever is going on there is or can be seen by the destiny of Kamushavaha, which has been changing hands for quite a while now. So when one side claims that they got the, something, the road or whatever, it doesn't mean they'll stay there. They'll get kicked out and again and again. So they got more support supplied on the Papasne direction to Russian troops, but the quality of the troops is uh, still desiring to be better. Zaporozhye front, no changes, artillery, fights. Kherson region, we can say now, our troops actually fortified themselves on the left side of uh, Ingulets. How close to Kherson is it? It depends. This uh, side is anywhere between 50 to 80 kilometers. Let's take the smaller 50 kilometers wide, and we managed to cross the river, uh, get the foothold, and have not lost a single piece of it to Russian forces. And they tried to counterattack, but they failed to kick us back. So they they probably will uh, try to push us uh, again, but. The closest point to Kherson from that part is about 15 kilometers, but uh, 
doesn't mean that we're in the city yet. Our troops just demonstrating that we can move, even when uh, the enemy has the advantage in numbers, which supports our statement that our troops are pretty amazing, good professional quality. And also our troops are advancing near Zoom on the west. So what are you trying to do? You're trying to cut the Zoom advancement off? No, we're trying to create a threat to Russian troops, especially to Russian artillery that is a bit to the north near Kamenka, that uh, also moves down south to attack our troops. Uh, this is an attempt to get them into counter-artillery fight and uh, get their attention. We cannot allow, we cannot afford ourselves to cut them off yet, we don't have enough uh, forces to do that, but we can prevent them from timely supplies and from using or con concentrating their fire on uh, our troops down south. The Kherson direction is probably most successful for us. Uh, just the fact that we are still holding the other bank is a big achievement. And a week of attempts, non-stop attempts uh, by Russian forces to kick us back behind the river failed. So, gauging overall, you think that there is no immediate danger to Serodonetsk group to be surrounded by Russian troops? Is that correct? Um, it's a difficult situation there. Uh, nothing new is happening, but it's it still stays pretty difficult. So, how would you... What would be your... How do you see their task? What is the main task of Russian troops there? Is it to take Slavyansk and Kramatorsk? Yeah, that would be their operative goal. Tactical, same, break our defense near Dagankova and progress towards Slavyansk, get to the border of Slavyansk, cross Siversky Donetsk uh, near Raigorodok and move to Slavyansk and uh, cross Siversky Donetsk near Liman, no, not Liman, from Azorne to Siversk, cut the road Bakhmut Lysychansk, surround our troops there and try to put a lid on this kettle and finish the troops inside. But uh, one cannot see substantial progress yet. All right, so we discussed that. We've been eight minutes live, a little less that. About 300,000 watching us. About a third of you left your likes, so please do the same. If you have not liked this uh, stream yet, please leave your like. That's the only way to promote it on YouTube and Google Media. And subscribe to Fagin Live. Uh, we are approaching one and a half million. Actually, one million five hundred and thirty already. And okay, let's discuss our weaponry. Today in Rammstein, there was a third meeting, and we'll show the picture. It's an uh, English picture, English language data. This is what Ukraine asked and what Ukraine got. You'll see that on your phone. There are three groups here. By units, tanks, 270 received. 500 requested. MLRS got uh, 5. 300 requested. I think they took these numbers from Podolek. He said, give me 300. And 150 millimeter howitzers. 250 are given. And 1,000 is requested. Oh, and MLRS, they're actually saying you got 50, over 50. So, looking at this table, do, can you say this is indeed correct data? Uh, what did Rammstein 3 give today? All right, let's clarify a few things. 
With tanks, it's generally a good situation. Mostly because of Poles, because they give us about 260 tanks. But we would like to have just as much more. How many Russians have? Maybe a little more than a thousand on the Russian side. And it's not really about the percentage in this case. 500 versus a thousand is a satisfactory situation for us. This is not a number that will destroy our professionalism and our advantages and the fact that we're mostly defending our positions and that our intel is more effective. MLRS systems, there are nuances here. It's a nuanced data. It's a, a 50 of MLRS of all kinds, not HIMARS. It's a mix. It's HIMARS, it's M270. We don't need 300 of them. 60 of those would be enough. But all types, Hurricane or uh, Grad, or things similar to Czech vampires, we would want to have more of those too. Part of them were given, and those 50 plus indicated. They're not HIMARS and uh, 270s. We'll talk about them separately. Now about the howitzers, we indeed got them over 250, so the number is correct, but not all of them are 155 millimeters, some of them are 152 millimeters. Those are Czech and Slovak uh, dams, which we have quite a number of, but we were promised some new, so we'll see what happens with it. And we'll be able to compare new deliveries with our real needs. So what did the Minister of Defense of the United States say? He said uh, we'll get 1855mm howitzers, 18 trucks to pull them, out a thousand uh, ammo to them. Uh, three HIMARS systems, special equipment for their repairs, uh, two systems of uh, shore defense uh, with harpoon systems, protected radio station, meaning the encoded encrypted communication, and about a thousand of optical electronic uh, devices for Intel efforts, including the night vision equipment. Canada and uh, Netherlands providing some artillery, and Germany is saying they'll give us three more Mars's uh, good MRS systems. At first they said four, but then they thought a little and said no, three. According to the data we can analyze from the main media, the heavier part of MLRS systems will have about 18 of them totally. That's about a division. One need, needs to understand that in an American division, uh, they have nine of heavy MLRS systems. So like a big division has nine, in our case we're basically getting two division sets. Is it enough or is it too little? To give some serious trouble to Russian troops? Yeah, that's a good amount. That will help us to continue with counter-artillery fighting and destroy their supply lines on uh, a serious segment of the front. But in reality, even three machines like that, set side by side with good uh, intel, there's serious uh, hassle for the attacking side or defending side. Is it an adequate answer to our real needs and requests? I don't think so. In reality, we need two, three times more, or at least twice more. But, for all, this is a positive development. 
that when we achieve, uh, when we get all of these uh, equipment items to the front, it'll affect the change, of course. Now regarding 155 millimeter howitzers, we're getting 18. Canada, Poland, and Netherlands likely will give another 18. So 36 added to 250 that we already have. It's not much and it's not little. It's not a qualitative jump, but uh, it's a good good way to get more help and to get some definite local advantage on different parts of the front. So, summing it up, the tempo of su support uh, after Rammstein is slower than we expected. Uh, the worst part is that it's being promised in August, so in June we'll have a bit less which pushes back our plans for uh, Napoleonic plans for advancement for another month or two. We can compare according to the plans of American side. Armored vehicle Bradley. Uh, they're giving a lot to Greece, 89 to uh, Croatia. A total number of 439 Bradleys, which, if we got at least a half, that would have changed the situation to our advantage you know, dramatically. But they're not giving. In the last 24 hours, they hit us a lot in Donetsk, Dnipropetrovsk, Kharkov regions, in Dnipropetrovsk region. Four civilians died. They destroyed over 10 private buildings, damaged the hospital. They shot uh, some sky oblast. So, in regards to the tempo of uh, to the cadence of supplies, I can propose a hypothesis. I was expecting quite a bit from this meeting, and I think I can see the contours of their new strategy for this period of war. We can start with political statements. Uh, Cole, uh, one of the vice ministers of defense of the United States, stated that their task is not to destroy Russia or defeat Russia. Their task is to get both sides to the negotiation table and uh, Russia needs to come there weaker than Ukraine. So they're moving the goalpost there. They're not keeping the focus on destroying Russian aggression, aggression aggressors, but it's uh, kind of moving it a bit to just weakening them. So at the bare minimum, to achieve some destruction, we need at least another zero to all the numbers of equipment they're giving to us. So, second aspect is there are sanctions. There are sanctions announced against three other Russian banks and Gazprom, either in retaliation or by plan, had cut the supplies of gas to Europe. And what's interesting, they did cut it to the countries that generally support them. So, speaking of Russian strategy here, um, remember we talked about Russia using nukes, nuclear weapons? Gas lines is basically a prolonged nuclear war in this regard. Because the energy, food, and other crises that stem from it have the same effect, same pressure on the West as if Russia used a small tactical nuke. They are still hitting the West, they are just making it uh, spread out in time. So, it makes uh, the West less likely to react to that in dramatic measures. And 
one thing I see that um, Moscow realized is that there is no way for them to achieve their goals quickly. So they need to prepare for this war. Russian Federation ends up being in a position similar to Iran, who is limited, nobody likes them, and so. But they still manage to do lengthy semi-hybrid wars around them. And they're setting their systems to work uh, alike for a long time. Uh, Medvedev's uh, tongue slip saying that maybe in two years there'll be no Ukraine. That kind of shows the increased window. At first they said a few weeks, then maybe a few months. Now they understand uh, this uh, goal is unachievable in the short term. What they're counting on is on the weakness of the West. And one of the best proofs that they're right is the cadence of military support that we're getting. They're not uh, zero, they're not uh, at the level where they're not helping, but they're lower than what would be needed to successfully defend. So these supplies, that slowness, is it artificial or is it natural? I'll answer that when I get to the Western strategy. So Kremlin is uh, prepping now for the lengthy fight, and their main bet is not victory in the field of Ukraine, but getting west to the stands where they would be pushing us intensively to sit down uh, at the table with the Russian side and uh, find peace solution to their aggression. And that's the whole strategy of the food crisis and gas crisis that is designed to create additional pressure, social pressure, economic pressure, and maybe leave the degree of, uh, get the rise the degree of uh, unacceptability of this war and by the society to a higher level, to push west to the new round of negotiations. By the way, Patrushev uh, in Russia said today that Russia is ready to sit down to negotiation tables and conclude the war with Ukraine as soon as possible, but the damn Ukrainians, they're refusing our efforts. And that basically is Russian effort to have a similar chunk of news uh, in response to the news about the world giving us more weapons. They want journalists because they usually the good ones work with uh, both sides. They do want the general message in press to sound like the West is giving more weapons to Ukraine, and Russia wants to talk peace. Guardian published today the results of uh, opinion poll in Europe. 32% Europeans want peace in Ukraine as soon as possible, while only 22 want to win over Kremlin. Uh, Germany, Italy, Poland, Switzerland, Great Britain, a big chunk of EU countries participated. Undecided, about 20%. They said they can support both sides to a degree, and that's the group that both sides are fighting for. Because uh, information warfare is usually going over the group that is not decided yet. So here Kremlin wants to increase the group that wants peace by all means. Mostly Italy is supporting that stance, about 52%. And the country most antagonistic to Moscow is Poland, 41%. 73% out of these 10 countries called Russia responsible for this war and over 50% said they need to diminish their dependence from Russia energy sources. So either the questions were written up pro uh, smartly or indeed the sentiment is going that way. And if 58% are ready to switch from Russian energy, that is basically highlighting the possibility for future sanctions. But in general, the sentiment is such, and this cannot not bother Kremlin, because they need to win in the information field as well. 
Now, I need to say one more thing before going to the West strategy. Yesterday we did not have time to discuss it, but it's a very loud uh, ping that we need to address. In Taiwan, uh, Xi Jinping, the head of the country uh, in China, uh, written an order that uh, Chinese troops can also take orders from the general secretary um, and do a sub-level military operation, so similar to what Russia called in Ukraine. And Taiwan said that this is a direct uh, statement against them. It's a definite threat. And Taiwan is still a world's largest supplier of semiconductors, so it's a big thing. Um, this, this is also internal uh, issue for China, so people are saying Xi Jinping might have adopted this law to uh, counter a possible threat to his regime in China. But if you look at it uh, wider, what if there would be a Taiwan crisis? And here is another side of my hypothesis describing the uh, slow tempo of our supply uh, of land lease or military supply to us. That in general the West understood and kind of accepted that uh, they can't really fight with China or Russia and regimes like that. And they can't really waste all their money fighting these threats. And it's also almost impossible to uh, get all the people in arms in those countries to fight uh, physically. The West is too busy building a new wonderful world where the fight with authoritarian regimes doesn't take much space. What West is ready to do is uh, to use economic weapons that uh, does not require any victims uh, or sufferings for the most part from the civilians but can also achieve results, albeit slower. So the West is switching to other oil suppliers. Egypt, uh, China and some other countries signed a treaty about building the gas pipe to Europe. So I also suspect that the sanctions will be on Russia for quite a while until the sides who are cutting and uh, figuring out the new shares of the market until they're satisfied. So, yeah, that will continue until the Russian companies are kicked out of the market. They have consensus about that. They don't have consensus about making sure Russia loses this war. Does, which part is missing? It? America? Europe? As a collective West, they don't have it. What I see is that, and it's my hypothesis only, what I see is that the splitting of Russia into 30 little republics with uh, nuclear weapons, and some of them would have people like Kadyrov uh, as their presidents, that means a lot of headache for the West, and they're not ready to deal with it. And overall, military loss, heavy military loss for Russia means a lot of uh, that kind of fallout later. So that's why their politics in supplying Ukraine is what they're talking about. They need to show Russia that uh, it is fruitless to continue military affair in Ukraine, lead Russia to the condition when they can absolutely not afford to support this war and force them to go to the negotiation table and finish the war in a political diplomatic way perhaps by pushing Russian Federation to the borders prior 24th of February which will be countered as the good victory for Ukraine at the same time uh, they get to keep the same Putin's regime that they helped to grow, just weakened and a bit more controllable. Quick victory of the Ukraine forces, which would be ensured by the quantity of weaponry we are asking for, maybe two, three months, uh, with a real triumph and kicking Russian troops out of our country. and. Uh, sending Russia into the spiral of the heaviest economic crisis and political crisis.
Well, that's kind of an old concept, right? When USSR was falling apart, that's what they were also following. It's just everything went sideways, but they attempted the same thing. Yeah, I think uh, you're right, and that's what the West is doing over and over again. Except for they very often they're uh, mistaken. Soft exit from Afghanistan didn't work. Uh, soft control of Soviet Union did not work. And even that soft control of Putin's regime, I predict, will not work. Because since Ukraine, even now, with the current amount of weaponry, manages to advance in the Zoom and near Kherson without even having Western uh, proper Western support, or having it maybe a third or a quarter of uh, what's needed. And th the West will continue supplying stuff, you know, maybe not in huge chunks, but bit by bit. Another Amstein, maybe another 18 MLRS, and so on. And there might be a day in a battle when Ukraine accumulates enough weapons and ammo and experienced troops to achieve serious and unrewindable military victories that will have an effect on the opinion of Russians on this war as well. For example, freeing Kherson. Yeah, for example, that's a good example. Imagine the impression it would produce on a Russian audience. I turn to you here because you're an expert on that side of the front. So imagine, what if we take Kherson now, not, not now, but like a month from now, and clean up the left bank? What happens in Russia? Well, first, there'll be a lot of noises coming from the top management of the country because they don't, wouldn't know how to sell that on the elections, and there is no good uh, story behind it. You can, again, go back to the stories about the to West that militarized Ukraine, and here is the result, our people are dying. But <coughs> the populace will take that painfully, for sure. We don't know how likely they are to bring it out to the streets, but because they don't have leaders right now. But they will take it painfully. Then there'll be questions lower levels asked, what were we doing there for half a year? You said that Ukraine will be running out of resources, you're lying to us. And that's where the evening of questions and answers starts. It'll start probably with an online protest and Q&A directed at Kremlin. And if the West could support that uh, flow of events by supporting Ukraine, we could inspire certain groups in Russia to take that on their banners. It actually creates a pretty heavy psychological cloud over the elite, current elites of Russia and the army, because they need to explain the failure and to say something. Because right before they were saying that they're almost winning, almost there, and then, oops, um, things are not as they seem. So what we think is there might be a good psychological crack in the Russian facade. And again, not because it was taken immediately. Uh, it retaken, recaptured back immediately. No, it's more Russia took it. They already trying to manage some economy there, change the street names, uh, you know, as they say, cooked some food, got the internet set up. Um, and here we are coming and changing that again. Kind of like in the Second World War when the cities were changing hands. Germans would come, put the street of Hitler. Russians would come, kick their signs down, put the street of Karl Marx or Stalin. So, yeah, that's uh, that situation would lead Russia to a new attempt to negotiate with the West from the position of the loser. Because, you know, if you lose at least your son, it'll be easy to neglect any of their statements because uh, you can't really advance Russians. You promise to do everything, but you can't. And our mm, smallest planning horizon probably would be towards Kherson. That's like a big sign that can be taken and can change uh, public perception again. 
Um, it was taken shortly after 24th, it was in Russian hands for a while, so if Ukrainians take it back, that would be definitely a strong message. And after that, there is a stochastic tree of variants that may occur, but we would be able to say that that first task is rather solvable for the Ukraine troops. Even with the arms you have, yeah, um, yeah, quite, quite solvable. It's achievable. It's a real task that could also change uh, things globally. But I think, just like in a good erotic movie, it should have a good voiceover. Because people need to feel that. That that is important. That that is a big event. Well, you know, there are two guys, Mark and Alexei, they're pretty good at uh, setting the public sentiment. Yep. And this is a good call that we can achieve and that we can also correct uh, the position of the West by doing it. So all we need to do is really tire the enemy and then get some noticeable operative uh, success. Uh, if we gain that, um, and I'm pretty optimistic we shall, uh, of course, would want more than we're given. But I think even with this, we might concoct some options for winning scenarios. All right, we have 430,000 watching us live, 36 minutes live streaming. Please continue sharing links in your media and groups. Subscribe to Fagin Live, subscribe to Rostovich. Another 200,000 people are watching us joined today since the first five minutes when we started. So I don't know, maybe you're new. Subscribe, share the links. If you're watching that in English, do not forget to subscribe to the privateer station and click that bell. I have one more question, Lexi. Do you have time? Yeah, I do. So, another foreign visit. Uh, they thought maybe today didn't happen, saying 17th, to think uh, it'll be probably just Macron. He might come and say something good and might say also, by the way, we should go talk to Russia. And I think in that Ukraine will have to go to the table of negotiations and uh, will be there too, he said. So I have a question. You've been there at that table back in the time. What do you think uh, changed? Why do you think the same table of negotiations will change anything with the country aggressor that uh, attacked Ukraine after the previous negotiations? It's pretty simple. It's what Biden thinks, that's what Macron speaks. Unlike the general opinion of the public masses that uh, politics is a lot of Machiavellian stuff and behind the scenes happening, frankly, you can believe a lot of things they're speaking out loud. They reveal what they're planning and what they think. Macron is uh, one of the more extreme points of the West where Basically, Russia and Ukraine would need to sit down and discuss and agree to a no-win situation to save faces and all that. I don't think America will go what uh, Macron and Scholz can go for, uh, like leaving some of the occupied uh, territories with Russia. But in general, the, of, uh, on the current situation of war, the West would agree to getting Russia weakened and getting it to the negotiations in a weaker position. At the very best, I'm happy that uh, there are no statements of saving Russian face and uh, making sure Europe is uh, safe. And have you seen somebody slap his face? Yeah, somebody uh, slap his face. He was uh, greeting somebody and just got a loud one on his cheek. Do you think there is a lot of pushback in the country? Oh no, I think somebody may have just listened to Fagin and Rostovich. No, 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 don't put that on us. We're not like that. Yeah, I know, right? I'm a foreign agent, you're a terrorist, declared in Belarus. <clears throat> so yeah, no, we're not calling on the French. <laughs> you notice he often gets things, some physical abuse by his voters. Yeah, he does. But uh, he actually is giving us some weapons. 
and he's giving way better than Schultz, even though his rhetoric is more diplomatic, so to say. But uh, I would agree, if he is giving us weapons, if he can give us more Caesars, he can say whatever he wants to say, just make sure that uh, the weapons are out of time. So do you think by the 17th or whenever all that will not go in the direction of, okay, let's do the referendum, maybe sign a peace accord? No. Um, out of the big success, uh, we will have a vote in the EU for the candidacy of Ukraine in this uh, structure. So that would be a general plus to our spirit that this war is not in vain, that we are fighting for good things and that our blood and tears will be heard. So it will be a big moral victory for us if that happens. I don't see any political or economic follow-up from it, but uh, and maybe okay, maybe political power, but that's also a good slap into Putin's face because uh, he started the campaign to destroy the country, and after that, it's being taken as a candidate to the EU. But we do have a problem, Mark. Tomorrow I cannot participate, and on Saturday, no, Saturday I can. Saturday I will be able to. All right. So Thursday is tomorrow. Friday you're participating. Saturday I am also participating in your stream. So we're missing Thursday. Yes, we'll miss Thursday and Sunday because, you know, day off. I do need one day off a week. Okay, we'll skip Sunday. So the next stream will be on Friday. Yes, next stream is on Friday. All right. I suggest we leave other interesting topics for Friday. We've been almost 42 minutes live. 433,000 people watching us live. And I ask to share the links to this cast in your accounts, social media. And do not forget to subscribe to our channels and to the privateer station if you're watching that in English. leave all the topics to Friday to ripen and we'll discuss them there. Thank you everybody, dear friends. Thank you Alexei. We'll see you Friday.